depending on, so the vast majority of children uh, may weave in and out of foster care, but then go home, or they may go back and forth and back and forth. The, the, the obligation of the child welfare system is to make sure that this child can go home. That's the best place for a child, is within their biological family, within their community, within that, that, that um, arena that should surround them. So um, it's about 20% of children who are ultimately freed for adoption, 80% go back home or go back and forth, back and forth, depending on their circumstances. So it's that 20% that are freed for adoption that the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption focuses on. Of course, we have a, uh, a, an umbrella of expertise about the whole child welfare system, but then we singularly focus on what about those children who've been freed for adoption? How do we make sure that we get a family for them as quickly and as effectively as possible? And how do you do that? So that's part of, we work within the systems, but what the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption does is, um, f a number of years ago we began to focus on the subset of those children, the children most at risk of aging out of foster care. So they've been in care for years, they've been freed for adoption, and then they turn 18, and that's the point at which they're released from the system, and the systems had failed them and hadn't found an adoptive family for those children. And that's about 20,000 children each year. So year over year over year, those children age out of foster care. The Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption stepped in and said, there's got to be a better way to serve these children. It is the birthright of a child to have a family, right? It's the legal and moral obligation of the systems that surround them to find them a family. And miserable failures 20,000 times year over year on the systems part that we didn't find them a family. So we created this um, model that we decided as a national nonprofit grant making organization, we could dedicate our resources to this target population of children, those children most at risk of aging out of care. And those are children who are age nine and older. Here's what we know. By the time a child turns nine in care and they've been freed for adoption, their likelihood of being adopted decreases significantly. Uh, so children age nine and older, children in sibling groups, children with special needs, children who've been in and out of care for so long that they've given up hope on themselves, they've given up and they push back when efforts at permanency are, are, are um, applied to them. So we focused on that. We created a model that said there's got to be a better way. We looked around the country and, and asked, why is it that children are aging out of care in your community? What is it that you're not doing or what is it that you're doing but's not effective in getting these children adopted? And the predominant, and we started this program in about 2002, 2003, and looking at how do we do this better? How do we step into this space and focus on this population of children? Um, and at the time, the default method of getting these children adopted was public displays. Put their faces on a website and hope that charismatically someone who's looking at how to adopt sees this website and sees these children and says, there, that's, that's my child. It's like a catalog. A catalog of children. And sometimes it works. But for this target population of children, again, older youth, children with sim in sibling groups, children with special needs, typically a family that jumps into this arena of I'd like to adopt a child doesn't look at a website and see a sibling group of three ages 8, 12, and 15, one of whom has been in and out of the juvenile detention center perhaps, and say, there's my ideal family. Right? That's the, because we carry these myths and misperceptions about who these children are. They're too old, too damaged, too dangerous. When they're simply reacting to the systems that have failed them and surrounded them for years. So we created this model that said, you can't just put their picture on a website and hope that they will get adopted. That's not effective. And is that how you would want your child um, um, in a system? If, if your child had to go in the system, is this how you would treat your child? Um, and so we created what we call a child-focused model, a child-focused recruitment model. And what it says is just do good social work. And what we would do is give grants to organizations, large or small, public or private, to hire a full-time adoption professional who would carry a, a small caseload of the longest waiting children in their community um, and, and, and do a number of things. First and foremost is create a relationship with that child. If a child's been in care five, six, or seven years, 
they remember former foster parents. They have a, 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 a range of adults and families that surround them already, best friends, coaches, teachers, therapists. They have, they have a, a number of adults in their circle already that they relate to, that they understand, that they care about, and who care about them. And so by developing this relationship with the child, they, the, the, the full-time adoption professional we call a recruiter, not only um, begins to gain the trust of the child, but begins to learn this sort of forensic journey of where this child has been and who has surrounded them, and they become potential adoptive resources. And then the recruiter also does a deep dive into the case file, so the agency has kept a case file logging everything that's happened to this child along the way, every court hearing, every placement, every, every movement to and from their home, who's in this child's life. So they look at that and do a dig and a deep dive into who else is in this child's life and what is the journey that this child has been on. And then they do what we call a diligent search. They may use technology tools or just through the, the digging through the case file, it begins to reach out to extended family members, to uh, people that have been in this child's life, um, best friends, families, whatever it is, and begins to identify real potential adoptive resources for this child. Someone the child may already know, hopefully, someone who may be in their extended family, someone who already cares about this child. And then the recruiter goes and begins to um, make those connections, prepares the child for what is this adoption journey going to look like, prepares the family for what has this child experienced, here are some challenges they may have experienced along the way. In other words, setting the real stage for what does it look like to bring this new family together. And then the recruiter stays with the family until that it gets to a court hearing and the judge says this is a legal ha a family. And frequently, quite honestly, the recruiters stick with the family post-adoption so that they help, because they have developed a relationship with the family, so that they can help with any challenges that may come along the way or any needs for resources. So it's, it, it is really just good social work, but it wasn't good social work that was happening in the system for this target population of children and youth. Well, that's not what I had in mind. I, th I was thinking of someone doing the work, but like just making cold calls to people that and, and looking for a fit, they actually insert themselves into their individual's life and, and say, hey, maybe you want to Right, Maybe right. want to do this. And, right. Yeah. And it may be that there are times um, with certain children that someone known to them isn't identified as a potential adoptive resource. Well, the agency all along for all the other children that they care for are recruiting foster families into the system, are recruiting adoptive families into the system. So if we don't find someone who's known to the child, that's when the, the recruiter will work in tandem with the agency and begin to look at other potential adoptive families that have stepped forward and said, yes, I'm interested in adopting a teenager, something like that. Okay, so the traditional catalog method versus your method, how more effective is it? Well, we um, in we permanent placement. They don't they don't come back. They stay. Right. In, we began this program officially as a pilot project in 2004 in seven states across the nation. We thought we'd just test it and begin to see, does this work, right? And um, it began to, to, we began to see that it happened very well. The children who had been in care for years were suddenly moving toward adoption because the recruiter simply said, hey, foster family, you've had this child for five years. Are you interested in adopting? No one had ever asked the foster family before, right? They already knew the child. They already cared for the child. And what the recruiter said is, if you're not interested, we're going to find an adoptive resource for this family. So the family said, wait, we're at risk of losing this child. Of course we'll step forward and adopt. And by the way, no one had ever asked us before. So, so again, we began to see very quick successes of moving children to permanency. Um, we began to generate the resources so we could grow the program because seven recruiters in seven states is wonderful, but it's not enough for the population of children that existed. Right now in this country, 125,000 children are waiting to be adopted. And the average age is about eight or nine, right? That turning point when they're at risk of, of not getting adopted throughout their journey in, in foster care. So we grew the program, garnered the resources and grew the program and by 2007 um, we realized we not only had enough um, recruiters in place we were in all 50 states um, had grown it very quickly but we couldn't become another untested program does this actually work at an evidence level so we recruited um, an outside um, evaluation agency child trends out of Washington DC to do a long-term randomized control trial evaluation comparing this model with this uh, 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 
um, effort at getting children adopted against whatever business as usual is in that same jurisdiction. So children from Columbus, Ohio, if they were part of the study, those children who were on the child-focused recruitment model caseload compared to children in Columbus, Ohio, in that agency who were being treated with whatever business as usual was, including uh, public displays or other methods of trying to get those children adopted. What we found after five years is that on average, a child served by this program is about 1.7 times more likely to be adopted. But counterintuitively, perhaps to all of us here, right, the older a child is, the more likely they are to be adopted. So up to three times more likely to be adopted. The, the, the older a child is, the more unlikely. To be the more likely, with this model. Oh, with this, with this model. model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, with right. this model. So it, it is, at an evidence level, shown to be much more effective you know, if you can move the needle one-tenth of one percent in child welfare, you're moving the needle. To move it three times is, is statistically significant. In other words, it works, and it works better than any other business as usual. 300 percent more. 300 percent right. more. Right. And for children with particular mental health issues, it was more than three times more effective. So it was hitting all of our target population issues about older youth children who are hard to adopt. The children who, quite honestly, as we looked through case files, as the recruiters began to do those deep dives that no one had done before, too often there was, there was a label identified to this child, unadoptable, unadoptable, mm -hmm. unadoptable, because, they're, because of their age, because of their race, because of their sibling status, because they have um, special needs. Whatever the reason is, when now what we were able to show is no child is unadoptable, that we can indeed get these children adopted, that we should get these children adopted. Race is an issue. Race is absolutely an issue. What we know is, uh, first of all, there's an overrepresentation of children in the fo of, of black children in the foster care system. If there's a, a what a, about a 13 percent population of black um, uh, Americans, right? But in the in the foster care system, there are about 24 percent of the children in foster care are black. When we look at those waiting to be adopted, um, um, again, those same sort of um, um, statistics apply. But interestingly, for those who get adopted. Right. Um, if there's a there's a, a 43 percent of children are white and waiting to be adopted, 44 percent of the children who are adopted are white. 24 percent of the black children are waiting to be adopted. Right. But only 13 percent of those children get adopted. So absolutely, there is a there's a racial disparity too. Now, some of that is we need to we need to make sure that we continue to bring more black families into the system mm -hmm. to adopt those children and make sure that they can get adopted. But again, whatever internal myths, misperceptions, or racist attitudes that exist get either subtly or overtly expressed in the child welfare system as well. Okay, so it's children eight, nine, and above siblings that want to stay together. Or yes. you're trying to get that should stay together, that absolutely. should stay together. Yep. And special needs children. And special needs children. And again, those children who are 15, 16, 17, who people believe, wait, if we let them age out, they'll be fine, right? They'll pull themselves up by their bootstraps, they'll figure it out, they're survivors, they're strong, they've been in and out of the system. When what we know is when a child ages out of care, their likelihood of negative consequences, long term negative consequences, increases significantly. Homelessness, unemployment, um, early parenting, substance abuse, all of, not because they're bad kids. Again, we don't want to play into the misperceptions that too old, too dangerous they've been in the foster care system. Rather, they don't have the safety net of a family. They're not allowed to make a mistake. They're not allowed to stumble. They get caught into systems immediately rather than be having arms wrapped around them and guide them along the way. No mentor. No mentor, no, no role modeling, no. Look, I, I, I've got two daughters who are, are grown adults right now, but how many times did they call and say, I just need a couple dollars, I gotta get my car fixed. Can I come stay home for a few weeks because I'm in between jobs? Of course, that's what families do for children, right? My kids who age out of care don't have that, that safeguard, and, and, and particularly now, whether it's relevant for this or not, during the pandemic, those those risks are increased significantly for kids in foster care. Just, right? I, mean, I just got in a car accident, you know, what do I do? Exactly. <laughs> that exactly. Sort of thing. exactly. I don't have health insurance, yeah. right? I can't get sick, or if I get sick, I'm going to be sicker because I can't afford to take care of it. Is there any successful route that you see more often, like, uh, 
boys joining the military or anything like that? For kids who age out of care, right. yeah, certainly, you know, and and these and and these kids are survivors. We do see there are one of the the challenges in this country is we apply resources to making sure that kids who age out of care can get access to college, can get access to resources. We've increased the age in many states to 21 to aging out of foster care. Um, but having said that, if we also applied equal resources to getting them families, we could reduce that cost of, of just helping them gracefully age out of care. We don't want kids to go through those negative consequences. We want to help them along the way. So yes, there are lots of, of financial resources to get them along, but military is certainly an option. Um, um, getting into college, getting into a, a system where they can get surrounded by a new family, right? A substitute family. They can create the relationships that weren't created for them through family. Hopefully. I just thought of this now, but what happens if they age out? Are they still adopted? Absolutely. In fact, we're seeing some adult adoptions happen through this program. Absolutely. You know, you can be adopted at any age. Um, and in fact, not. we're supporting a program in Los Angeles where it's just a caseload of 18 to 21 year olds. Let's move them to permanency. Let's move them to adoption or older, you know, but right now that's the caseload, but they could be 22, 23, 24. Let's get them adopted, absolutely. And again, you just go back to that same thing. Who's important in your life? Where is extended family that might step forward? Where is a former foster family that you lived six years with, um, then you left and, and you aged out and, and, and that family, again, had they known that you would still be um, uh, wanting to be adopted, they absolutely would take you in as as permanent member of your, their family. So if anybody could, uh, so I could adopt a sixty year old. Yes. Yeah. But sure, if you wanted to. Is that true? <laughs> I think so. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> well, I'm guessing they might look at that. The courts might look at that and say, no, what what's what's going on here? Right. Right. Okay. So it seems like you're a very like you have to get into the specific details, and you can't have a broad like. I look at their normal foster care system as like uh, an ad adoption model is like the infantry and you guys are like the special forces. Like it's a strategic, very detail-oriented process. It is strategic and goal-oriented, right? Um, we also were able to attract some additional outside resources to help us now. It was lovely to have two or three recruiters in a state, but imagine even six or seven recruiters in a state like California where the need is so profound, where it could take 200 recruiters to address that target population of children. We weren't able as a nonprofit organization to garner those kinds of resources, but in partnering with some outside philanthropists now, what we're doing is taking this program to scale in states. In other words, how many recruiters will it take? to cover that target population in that state, and how do we implement a co-investment relationship? These children are in the custody of the state or the county. It is their legal obligation, it's their financial obligation. But if we can do a, a, a public-private partnership and bring philanthropy to the table and encourage states to invest in an evidence-based model, what we find is not only are they succeeding in getting these children into families, but they're saving critical dollars. Because what we know is when you avoid right those negative consequences of homelessness, of unemployment, of substance abuse, of incarceration, you're saving dollars. Also, those are the long-term dollars. Do you dollars. have specific numbers? Um, there is the, the um, Jim Casey group actually put a dollar figure to that, that um, what we do when we allow children to age out of care is we, we create a tab of about eight billion dollars a year for this country of the costs of lost wages, you know, uh, incarceration, so all of that. So eight billion dollars could be saved. And if you do that on a state-by-state -state basis, that's the long-term savings. The near-term savings for states is you get these children out of expensive foster care and into adoptive homes. You get a child adopted at 12 that probably would have stayed in care six more years. You've saved six years of foster care dollars that you could be routing back into other effective programs. So absolutely, we know that in Ohio, for example, we took the, the program to scale in Ohio in 2012 through this co-investment relationship. We know that, that we've saved the state in excess of $64 million at a minimum. At just a minimum, in Ohio. Just in Ohio. Yeah. yeah, and that's just what you can quantify. You can't yeah. tell, like, the perpetual adopt, like, the adopted child might want to adopt a child. Exactly. Because they had it. Well. Exactly. 
exactly. And we haven't really made those long-term calculations. Well, we just, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so absolutely. We also know um, we did a, a follow-up survey of older youth adopted through this program. Um, what are their long-term outcomes? Are they better? I think you had asked this earlier. Are they better than if they had just aged out of care? Uh, or, or some other circumstance. And what we found, and we haven't released the, the, the results yet, but what we found is with this survey, and it wasn't a rigorous evaluation, but it was a survey of, of youth adopted, is their outcomes are much better. They are employed. All of them still live with their, are, are part of their adoptive family. They're older, so they might be 25, 26, 27, so they may not be living with them like, a, like any other family, but they're still uh, legally <clears throat> part of that family. So we know the program at a, at a smaller scale, we need to do a larger study, also works in the long term. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is, is there such a thing as getting too much to, so, like, it going to sound like a bizarre question, but yeah. if I gave you a billion dollars yeah. right now, but I said you have to spend it in a year. Yeah. Would you know how to allocate it, or are you going to have a hundred million and throw it in the cash reserve and use it over ten years? I think because we have been taking this program to scale over the last four years. Well, Ohio was the first in 2012, but then we really began scaling in 2017. We're now scaled in ten states. I think now that we've tested and tried it and and worked out what it takes and understand the differences between states. Go ahead and give us a billion dollars, and we would get year. it in place. You could put it to use in a year. We could begin to put it to use in no, a year. No, that's what I mean. You yeah. have to spend it in a year. We have to spend it in a year. Um, would you know where to throw it? I think yeah. we would know where to throw it. Yeah. The trouble is, this is a long-term endeavor, of so course. you can't just get kids adopted that first year. You've got to get right. the recruiters hired, the caseloads filled. They've got to get to know this child. So we know it takes 12 to 18 months to okay. get to get a process scaled. So if you gave me 18 months, sure. Two years. Two years, okay. you bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, now, um, do, can you tell me one, we, we, I, I spoke about this, I think, with Marissa, about what, just one story of start to finish <laughs> of of any of the good success story. Yeah, yeah, you know, the one story we, we tell and we share broadly is the, the Maya and Hannah story. Um, they were in care in uh, New Hampshire for five years. They went as, as young children, um, and they went into care because of extreme substance abuse of, of the, the family. Um, Maya tells the tale that at age 10, she was driving her parents home from a party because they were too, um, you know, drunk or, or, or whatever, they couldn't drive. So at age 10, she's driving her family. Her sister's five year, Hannah is five years younger than she is, and so Maya stepped up and frequently was essentially her mother, um, you know, taking care of them in the home. They lived in and out of homes that had, you know, no food, no flooring, no nothing that made it a home, you know. Um, but they went into care, were in care for five years, um, Maya tells the story of the first time that she went into a foster care home and the room was empty and it was dark and all she felt was, you know, sort of loneliness and despair. So even moving from not good circumstances but what she knew into foster care that, that didn't, didn't really fill her soul yet because it's now it's an unknown. And what's going to happen to my sister? I think luckily they were together but at one point Maya even said to her caseworkers, I understand that it's difficult to get siblings adopted. Go ahead and get Hannah adopted if you have to, and because she needs a home. This is what the sister said. This is what the sister said. So she, at age 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, understood way more than any child should have to understand about despair, about substance abuse, about caretaking, about love, about loneliness, all of those things that had just gelled in her system. And then they landed on the Wendy's Wonderful Kids caseload. And I think that the recruiter's name was Laura, found them a home, found them a family who already had raised three sons, but were looking at, we still have room in our hearts, we still have room in our home, saw this, this sibling group of two and immediately was connected to them. Long story short, they were adopted when uh, Maya was 14 and Hannah was nine, I believe. Dad's a firefighter. Um, they just have now, they're surrounded with the kind of love and family, and they're both thriving in school, doing all of the kinds of things that, that every child should have a right to do, which is just normalcy, uh, the, the right to grow and play and not be concerned about, do I feed my sister today? Um, should, I, should I deny myself my sister so that she can get adopted? Um, they've been able to relax 
into family life. Now, will these children still have challenges? Of course. Think of what they've experienced as young children, as you know, as those those normal ages and stages process of child development get interrupted along the line, as issues of trauma set in as they're developing. And so they'll still have challenges, but what they have is a family that is committed to them for the rest of their lives so that they can work through whatever challenges they might have together. That's the power of family. That's the power of this child-focused recruitment program of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. I guarantee that those children were on a track for either getting separated or aging out of care, and yet now they have a family. Okay. And they were 10 and? Five. 10 and five. Yeah, when they were adopted, I think. Uh, is that right? Yeah, I may Yeah. They were adopted at age. No, not adopted, I'm sorry, when they went, went, oh, when they went to care. Into care, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, five. 10 and They were in care for five years. Yeah. They were back and forth. Though. Yeah, 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 back and forth. So they were in care for five years, but were adopted at 14 and 9. The motivation behind all of this was, I mean, Dave Thomas was adopted himself. He was adopted, right, yeah. right. He created the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption um, when he was still CEO of the Wendy's company, but was beginning to move toward those latter stages and beginning to move on toward retirement, but, but understood that, you know, in the DNA of this company was this notion of giving back. And how could we as a company um, do that best? And, be, and and it only works well, I think, sometimes when someone has a personal connection to yeah, it. Yeah, it sounds like he wants what was done for it. But he had a rough upbringing. He had still. a rough upbringing. But that made him understand, I think, this target population of children we work with, older youth, you know, who feel abandoned, neglected, who have to who have to figure out life on their own because he left home at 16. His, um, you know, he was raised by his grandmother, um, uh, and then he he figured out how to how to make a successful life. So he understood that you can do it, but is that what we should force children to do? Right. right. He understood that uniquely. Right. Do you see it a lot where there are? Because I hear about it a lot. I hear about it with my friends, actually, from childhood. Is, is, you know, they have their kids, they raise their kids, and then they're like, you know, we still got the skill set and the time, and we still want to do it. Is that, is that really common? That is, it is common. And it's great for this, again, this population of children, right? Um, as a 45-year-old, 50-year-old, you may not want to deal with diapers and midnight feedings again, right? Even though you love children and babies. <laughs> But wait, I've raised my own children. I understand what adolescence is all about. I get it. I get that they're going to push and test and tug and pull. And so I can step in and perhaps be an even better parent the second time around yeah. for, for a child that needs more intensive understanding of why they're acting out. Because it's not just that I'm an adolescent, which is part of it, but I'm an adolescent that has experienced incredible trauma in my life. That has impact on how I view the world and how I view adults. And so yes, I think sometimes older couples, singles, who you know who have delayed having children and now think, well, again, I, I don't want to have a baby, but I, I, I really want to have a family, can step in and think about adopting an older youth. Where do we get the 20,000 figure from? The, 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 the government, um, the, the federal government, the uh, um, Children's Bureau, and Children's it creates uh, an annual statement of statistics of what's going on in the child welfare system. How many children are coming into care? How many children are leaving? How many are freed for adoption? How many leave to emancipation? In other words, that's what we call aging out of care emancipation. How do you think the recent events are going to affect that number? Well, um, what we know is there aren't as many reports being made, one, of uh, abuse um, because people are sheltering in place, because teachers, schools weren't open, and teachers are one of those primary routes into saying, hey, there's a problem with this family, we're seeing, we're seeing something, you know, and they make reports. So we believe that as things open up again, whenever they do, that there may be a flood of children coming into care again. Um, so that's, that's one impact. We also know in many states, courts have closed down, or they've slowed down because they're using virtual um, uh, platforms, and the result is there are backlogs of hearings, backlogs of, of, of um, adoptions, backlogs of termination of parental rights. So we're, we're getting, we may get clogs in the court system. So I'm, I'm not looking forward to the next few years. It's unknown. It's unknown, and we just don't know if, if there will be an explosion of children coming into care, which means down the road an explosion of children needing to be adopted. We right. just, we don't know, but we're not anticipating really good things yet. Yeah.
Yeah. All right. Well, all right, what am I missing, girls? <laughs> There's got to be something that you said he should have been asking this. I don't know if you want to uh, talk about the expansion again, because you said we have 10 scale states, we have 11 now with Michigan. So if you want to redo that piece, just, I don't know if he's going to use it or not. But I know. Sure. By the time it airs, we have 15, but yeah. Yeah, but, well, yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, wouldn't that be great? You, you, so you guys have tried to get into Los Angeles area, but had some issues, huh? We're working on it. We've got some great relationships there. We've certainly met with Bobby Cable and um, the, the head of child welfare in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, it's the balance between scaling a state and scaling the largest child welfare system in the nation, Los Angeles. Can we do both or should we focus just on Los Angeles? We were really close and then obviously pandemic hit and budgets are going to be strained. Our conversation has to be at this point, it's still a co-investment relationship. Budgets are strained, we understand, but there still is a return on investment and there's still a, me a legal and moral obligation for permanency for these children. So nothing's changed in that sense. I think what we're continuing those conversations. It's a difficult county. It's a difficult state. Yeah, um, yeah, but bureaucracy. Yeah, it's yeah. It's huge. It's just enormous. It's huge. But yeah. if we can do it, you know, we said that about New York and what we finally did. We are scaled in New York, but we had to bifurcate the contract. There's a, 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 a New York State contract and there's a New York City contract because they don't sometimes play well together. That's all right. We'll do it however we have to do it to get these children served. So we started with New York. If we can do New York, surely we can do California too. I think I've heard New York is harder to deal yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. So what you do sounds like a lot like CASA. It sounds a lot yes. like a one-on-one -on -one thing. It right, is. Right. And I mean, to, the, to me, they sort of look like the, term, the internal affairs of the yeah. system. It's like they're, they're making sure the whole process yeah. works. So do you have a little story about your relation with them? Do you, you work with them now? You're, you're on do. the board, right? We do. Well, it, it's, it's uh, actually when we started the program in 2004, I had, before I started at the foundation, I was the director of a CASA program. So I understood CASA intimately and that model intimately. And and you'll see some some crossover in the, the child-focused recruitment model and the, the CASA model because it is, look, life is about relationships. That we deny that at a child welfare level is crazy. So we've got to build in relationships, we've got to build in accountability, we've got to build in how do we uh, pay attention to those most at-risk children and that's that that linkage between CASA and child-focused recruitment because that's we're, we're all dealing with those same children. So you're in communication with them a lot? Yes, and, and I sit on the national board now. I, I used to sit on the Ohio board. I ran a CASA program. And our recruiters work with CASA volunteers. Absolutely, they have to, because they're the eyes and ears of the court. They have valuable information that the recruiter can use in filling in blanks in a case file that might not have the kind of information or might not be as up to date. And so the more of these kind of relationship-based um, activities that we can have on behalf of a child, hopefully then the child feels a little bit more secure in what's happening to them as well. Is it cost that allowed to be the recruiter themselves? Uh, we don't have that. It doesn't exist that way, and that would probably break sort of the what is the obligation of the CASA volunteer as the independent eyes mm -hmm. and ears of the court versus the recruiter who, who... And there are times when a CASA volunteer may say adoption's not best for this child. We're at the stage where we say adoption is what needs to happen for this child. So I think it, it, it might blur some of those it's lines. Like a yeah. Of interest, yeah. But having said that, absolutely work in, in, in absolute tandem. Right, right. Make sure it needs to go. Can you talk at all about the impact COVID 19 had on the system and how our recruiters have innovated since the pandemic? Because, I mean, that's not going away anytime soon. But I'm yeah. just curious yeah, if, if you're not including it, you don't have to. Like, Definitely. No, no, yeah, no. Not, I mean, you can't make any mistakes here. <laughs> well, the only mistake you. is not, not talking about something. <laughs> okay. Sure, when, you know, when COVID-19 hit, as we all began to realize this is going to go on longer than a, a couple of weeks, um, we also began to realize that this has a profound impact on children in care for a number of reasons. Let's look at the first. Um, a child's placed with a family that is now under economic distress because they've lost uh, jobs or they're under health distress because they, one or more of the family members have COVID. That child is at, at immediate risk, one, of getting COVID, like 
anyone in a family would, but two, of being removed from that family and moved to another family. So now we're, we're putting the child through the trauma of another move on top of just saw this family that I've been with, they're, they're in distress, but I'm having to move away from them and into another family that I don't know what's going to happen. So there's that, that first uh, line. Our kids in care, because they have been through so many layers of trauma, frequently have their own health issues, um, physical and, and, and uh, emotional health issues. And so their systems are at an elevated risk for contracting um, the, the, the illness, right? Because, because their system is, is uh, but the immune, their immune system may be, may be challenged a bit simply because of how long they've been in care and where they've been. Um, they also have issues now, profound issues of isolation if they're in a group home or if they're in an institutional care. Again, not only at great risk of contracting uh, the coronavirus, but because everything closed down, caseworkers aren't coming in to visit them, families that they may have been matched with can't come in and visit them, and so they're forced into this mode of isolation. They're already feeling isolated. They may already feeling uh, be feeling, uh, you know, issues of despair or loneliness by virtue of who they are in a child welfare system. Now we've compounded that through this disease. So what we had our recruiters do is very quickly pivot. You can't, st we get, you can't visit them. You can't have face-to-face -face contact, but you can very quickly um, if they've got a phone, get on your iPhone and have FaceTime contact. If they've got a computer, hook them up to Zoom and, and do Zoom meetings. Even we've had recruiters get really creative and they'll get in their car, um, they'll pack two lunches, they'll run up to the door, drop a lunch at the door, get back in the car, and then they'll share lunch over, you know, over FaceTime or something like that. So what we've found is there's actually more contact because it's easier to make a phone contact than to get in the car, go visit, go home that might be a, you know, a two hour effort, I can get on the phone quickly and have more contact with this child. So our recruiters have very quickly pivoted to um, creative tactics for staying in touch and being able to assess and respond to what's happening with this child. He seems really depressed right now. I need to make sure that the foster family understands because that child may only be sharing things with me that the rest of the system ha isn't hearing because they trust me so much. So they've really become a lifeline for these children in so many ways. One of our recruiters sent a, a box of books to a child and then she was reading some of the same books so they could share, you know, just incredibly creative ways. But th the bottom line here is that when we hit crisis times like this, we have to remember our most vulnerable populations, right? The homeless population who are on the street, who are at such risk. Uh, who may not be getting the food they need to begin with, but now food shelters are, or food uh, pantries are so overwhelmed with requests. How are we making sure that our most vulnerable populations are adequately dealt with during times of crisis, and that includes children in foster care? Do, do you think that that forced adaptation to the new th way of doing things might actually have a positive impact in the long run? Like, will we'll you Zoom when we have to we can reach out to multiple? Absolutely. Kids faster. Not only that, we've had to, uh, we and others have twisted courts' arms to say, you don't have to close down. If it's legally feasible to have a hearing via Zoom, why wouldn't you do that? And in fact, it may make it easier on families who struggle to get downtown during the workday for a hearing. If they can do it from Zoom from their home, we're going to get more efficient as, as a court, and particularly with adoptions. Final, we can finalize adoptions on Zoom, no issues. Everything's done before it gets to court. It's really just the final process. So yes, absolutely, I think it will make us, look, there, there's still some, <laughs> um, some issues with, we all do better with social interaction, right? I would have much rather shaken your hand or given you a hug when I walked in the door. Um, I, thankfully, we're not doing this on Zoom. We're able to do this face to face. So there, there's human, of course, value in, in human touch, but if we can't do that, then what's the next best thing? Right. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? I mean, this is a maybe a loaded question to us, <laughs> but if if you could undo it and there were no restrictions, uh, do you think it would be better? Think if there were no if there were no restrictions with uh, the uh, the the disease and the lockdown for your specific thing, I'm not talking about the economy, Joe. You think it would be that would be better? You'd be better off. 
if there were if 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 we just went ahead and had face to face meetings. Yeah, and, 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 and just let the chips fall where they may with the the risk factor. I don't think which so. We don't know what the risk. Yeah, factor we don't know. I, I I can't imagine. I cannot imagine that being the case. Yeah. How many of our children on the caseload would simply have died? Oh, okay. So you're worried about the, yeah, the mortality rate. Absolutely, oh, okay. and 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 the and the the infection rate, of course, would have mm -hmm. been hot because again, we're dealing with older youth, so we're not dealing with infants and toddlers and whatever the research currently says today. I'm not sure, but right. we're dealing with the older youth that, that that people are saying yes, not only contract it but but spread it, right? And so mm -hmm. we're and, dealing and mental health right? and mental, mental health, health and yes. physical health. Yes, too. yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. So I think to for for systems to be able to pivot and keep the connection strong however we can do that now we've got an issue with with uh, rural populations and populations that don't have access to high-speed internet now we now we've lost all connections right so it becomes more of a policy issue how do we make sure that everyone has access to high-speed internet so that they can keep those connections for education for child welfare for for medicine for juvenile justice whatever it is um, that's another policy issue that has to be addressed okay. so you, th you think it's a necessary service? absolutely okay. yeah yeah, I say that. I haven't thought about it before. I said absolutely, but yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> All right. Anything else you wish I had asked? I can't think. Anything else? Did yeah. we cover everything? Yeah, take time. yeah. I mean, I, I guess the scope. What we haven't talked about is, as of today, mm -hmm. we have more than 450 of these funded recruiters across the United States and Canada. We have finalized in excess of 9,200 adoptions. The average age of those children being adopted is 13. The majority are in sibling groups or have special needs. 25% of the children that we're working with had already had a failed or a disrupted adoption, and then they came on to this caseload. So we're clearly um, not only working with a vulnerable population, but we're working with a population that was invisible and voiceless to the system and we're moving them toward what other people had thought was impossible that these children were unadoptable so i think what we're proving is unadoptable is an unacceptable notion we just need to continue to garner the resources to do it at the scale that the country deserves yeah the the adoption issue especially with aging out became very uh it, it hit home to me when i spoke to three different psychiatrists that are involved in this sort of stuff and they both came up with different studies and whatnot but it was somewhere in between 40 and 60 so we'll just say 50 percent of children that age out end up homeless yeah. chronic homeless yeah, chronic. not homeless for two months homeless right. for five years right. so if it's twenty thousand a year that means you're adding to a pool of homelessness in urban environments of ten thousand a year, year. hundred thousand every day over a year you over know? a year <laughs> and and the the one study that we go back to all the time is that first year out of care one in five children are homeless and those are the ones we know about that first year you know they they exit the system and they're homeless those are the ones we we're not accounting for the ones that have a friend and they're couch surfing and they go somewhere else on their couch they just don't have some place to live absolutely we've got to stop the madness yeah yeah well we have that issue now with the you know children that usually go to the community college and they close college down so that, that was something else during the pandemic that we were talking to governors saying, say something in your state about children in foster care who had aged out of foster care who are in college, who will have no place to go, figure it out, put them in hotels, have the school open a, a, a special building that they can keep safe, do something. You can't push these kids out on the street. Yeah. 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 Did, did anybody? Yeah, you know, a number of states have stepped forward and understood, but it, it took a few. You know, again, we were all kind of dealing with this. Is this two weeks? Is this six weeks? Is this twelve weeks? Yeah. It took a while for it to set in that this was for the long term. So now we've got to do something. We talked to a number of states, and Ohio was one of them that said, "Don't let children age out of care. I don't care what, whether it's eighteen or twenty-one. Don't let any child age out." during the pandemic. Extend foster care for as long as you need to. So a number of states, California is one of them as well, that stepped forward and just said, we won't let children age out during That's this fair. time. That's fair. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Great. I think. I mean, I think. I great. Well, it feels like a long way for an hour. I hope you felt well, like it was worth it. It could have been 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's only going to be about... A minute, yeah. Know, well, <laughs> more than that. The whole, the whole story of... Uh, Yes. Animation or something. Nice. You know? yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I learned a lot. Good. Yeah. When do you fly back? 
Uh, tomorrow morning. Okay, good. So you can relax tonight a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, wish that we could take you out to dinner or something. <laughs> Apologies for lack of hospitality I, here. I spent about an hour and a half looking for the original Wendy's until I realized it's it was not gone. Right. Okay. <laughs> like, I'm sitting right here. Is that <laughs> <laughs> then I looked it up, it's like it was closed down in 2007. <laughs> yeah, yeah. now it's the Catholic Foundation or something. Right. That they yeah, sold the land. There. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, and and right. obviously, if there's anything else that you need, we can we can do yeah, whatever we, you need us to do. do with the post-production and what